Up next are the lightning talks. Um, basically, I'll explain how we do it in a second, but you all get the opportunity to stand up here for five minutes and have a very quick lightning talk. Um, slides are also supported. And basically, we'll do it a bit different from yesterday, if you were there yesterday. Um, but I'll explain the entire thing again. Um, you can come here in the front and we'll make a line that goes like somewhere around there. And then you can present the topic that you want to see. Um, but you can also present a topic you would like to hear that someone else tells you. So you say, okay, yesterday we had someone, okay, I want to hear a lot of things about how to import animations in Godot. And then you say that, you uh, quickly speak that here in front of the audience. If you don't want to speak, I can also tell it instead. Um, we'll make a sticker and I'll then ask a uh, round later the entire audience, okay, is someone here that knows about how to import animations in Godot? And then that person can talk five minutes about how to import animations in Godot. Um, we'll not only do this though, um, if you have a talk prepared, uh, you can also come here, uh, quickly like tell everyone what you want to speak about, uh, we'll write it down, and if you already want to present your own talk, please make an X in the corner of this, this note, but I'll also tell you if you're here. And then we'll, you can also present like the talks you, present, you want to present yourself, you prepared yourself. Yeah. Um, was that unclear? Do you, do you know what to do? So I repeat again, if you have a talk prepared, come here, make a line, uh, and then quickly tell the audience okay, what you want to do. And the second thing is, if you have a question that you want to know about, or a talk you want to hear about, but you can't really present that yourself, you can also come to the front, and then we can also record all that, and then ask the audience later if they know something about this topic. So yeah, one person's already here. Is anyone else here that wants to present? If no one else comes, I will talk for 30, <laughs> 45 minutes. Uh, no problem. But anyways, uh, I have a talk prepared, uh, Godot Beyond Games. So it's about uh, using Godot in cars for augmented reality HUDs and then uh, implementing augmented reality experiences using Godot for robotic simulation and embedding Godot into, into other applications like uh, a desktop application or a mobile app or or even Blender. Okay, yeah. Mm. Raise of hand, how many of you want to hear about that? That's a good amount of people. <laughs> okay, but is it the only person that wants to know or has some knowledge to share? Is no one else? Come to the front. Okay, otherwise you'll put me on the spot and I'll have to talk about what I prepared. <laughs> yeah, come to the front, make a line here, just... We did it. Like yesterday, we, ha we put up questions instead of people, and then you would read the questions and we'd find people who would be able to talk about those topics. Maybe that works better since it worked yesterday. Can you explain that again for me? Yeah, so... You have these sticky notes and people write down things they're interested about and have questions about and then you read them out a lot and people who have expertise in those fields would then raise a hand and be like, yeah, I could talk about that and then they would talk about that and it was pretty nice. I mean, you do you. But no, we can do it. The difference is basically you don't have to present it. You can also just come to the stage or quickly, not to the stage necessarily, just write down what you're interested in and then I will present it. Um, yeah, you can do that too. Uh, you too. I don't. Uh, do you want to present, Quill? Okay. I would love for anyone to show us how and when you are using Hot Reload in Godot. Yeah, perfect. And I would also be very curious about how you go about prototyping in early stages and like quickly iterating. If anyone has something to show about that. Hi. Um, would anybody interested in using Godot as a wallpaper? Anyone else? Anyone want to write down a topic they're interested in too? Okay, then I also have a talk I could do, uh, which is about VFX. 
I'll, it's 12 tips I could speed run in five minutes. I'll also write that down. In the meantime, if anyone is still interested in more topics, uh, feel free to write them down. Was that everyone that is interested? Are there any more questions? Okay, okay, sounds good. Then I will read these to you. Um, if there's someone that has expertise in the topic in the question I'm going to ask, um, please raise your hand. And then you can do a five minute, you don't have to take all five minutes, but you can quickly answer the question, come to the front and do it. Um, there are some here that also just want to present. Um, if I read this, this out loud and just tell me, okay, this is the one I'm going to present and I'll give you the sticky note to you. So yeah, um, this first question, I'll just go in a random order, is uh, we are in Godot. Uh, how, how can I port my Unity project, uh, my, VR, my VR Unity project into Godot? Does anyone there have some expertise they want to tell? Is it... Yeah, I'll, I can, if no one is there for you, uh, for this, I'll wait a second. You can look if you actually know stuff about it and I'll come back to it later.
Um, a very similar question, however, is uh, the current state of Godot XR, especially, wait, is this a question or a talk? The current state of Godot XR, especially pass-through and AR. Okay, if no one is uh, raising their hand, I suppose this is also a question. So maybe we need some XR, AR specialists for Godot. Um, especially pass-through and AR. Yes. Okay, do you want to make a talk about this? Okay, okay. Then I have a question here about Godot and how it works together with Rust. Um, does someone have any experience in that field? You? Okay, okay. Then can you pass this to him? All right, thank you. Then we have um, endless words, worlds, sorry. Physics and how big world coordinates and big world coordinates. Does someone want to share the knowledge with that? How to make big worlds in Godot? How you deal with flow point precision is what I think this is aiming at. Anyone here? Okay, then I'll ask that again later in a second. What is this? Oh, this is hard to read. <laughs> Things to consider when creating an anime game. Is this, am I reading this correctly? Okay, okay. Um, the, the brackets after that is bracket opening physics, bracket closing. <laughs> um, does someone feel they are proficient in this topic? <laughs> An online game, okay. <laughs> that changes a lot of things, okay. So let me redo the question. Things to consider when creating an online game with mostly the focus on physics. Does someone know? Um, <laughs> that was, okay. Does uh, someone feel they know something about this and want to share their knowledge? Perhaps some people from the mirror thing, I think? that. We did things on this? They're on the other top right now. Damn it. Okay. I'll come back to it. Then there was a question on how to do prototyping with uh, Godot. Does someone want to share how they did it? How they do prototyping in Godot? What they do about, or what things they do, what plugins they use maybe? No one then? Okay. Then this, I think, as was a talk. This was the Godot as a wallpaper. Um, where's the Godot as a wallpaper person? Then I'll give you this to you. <clears throat> I'll, I'm coming. Wait here. Can you? So, thank you. Okay, let me quickly check how much time. Oh yeah, one more minute. This Godot Beyond game was yours, right? Um, do you want to combine these two talks? Is that the same thing, or is that different things? Okay, okay. Um, then we have a question about how to exp or exporting 3D models. Um, what are the advantages of Blend versus GLTB? Um, or what is the advantages of the one versus the other? Was it di what are disadvantages of maybe using .blend? What are disadvantages of maybe using .gltb? Um, is there anyone that knows a lot about that and wants to share that? Yeah, it is basically, um, if I am working in Blender and I want to export my 3D model to Godot, should I use the .blend fo uh, file or should I use the .gldb file? You already have two and I see someone in the back there. <laughs> I'll give it to him. Thank you. <laughs> and then here's a 2D level design tips uh, how to start a level. Um, is this a question or was there someone that wanted to present this? Okay, um, then this is a question uh, and it's about how to start a level in 2D. Um, does anyone have some tips they want to share about this? Maybe some tilings, I see someone in the back, I'll leave it to them. Okay, then let me quickly go back to the topics at the beginning that no one uh, sadly know about stuff. Um, the hot, re oh, I forgot the hot reload, thank you. Um, 
This was the talk, right, from you? No, no, no. No, was was the question? Okay, then I think this was also a question, how is the state of hot reload in Godot? Um, how to use it and how it is, does it work right now? Um, does anyone know about hot reload in Godot? Has used it before and wants to share it. There's someone. What was uh, screamed through the room? How to use it and how, yeah, basically how to use it. <laughs> how you're using it and how to use it. Okay, let's quickly go over these real quick. Um, this is the first one was VR and Godot, how to port from uh, Unity to Godot. Someone seems to know that. Then the second one was the um, endless worlds, physics, and working with big world coordinates. Then we have the um, physics in online games and other things to consider when creating online games. Okay, that's the people in the other room. I guess it's an unfortunate coincidence. <clears throat> and the last thing was about just prototyping tips. Oh, there is someone. I'll give it to you in a second. Um, the last thing is about prototyping tips in Godot. Does anyone have any? Okay, perfect. All right, then, you're in the front and you also have two talks, so let's start with you. <laughs> and you have five minutes. I will be keeping track of that. Five minutes per talk, not five minutes in total. Oh yeah, five minutes per talk. Right? Do we have enough time for this? Why don't you see anything? I'm not sure. I need to ask tech. <laughs> I, I guess I will. I will. Okay. I I guess I will start talking about the other uh, talk, the current state of uh, uh, XR, and then then uh, I will just uh, I will fix my machine after that. Maybe uh, it's it's a Windows machine, so I will probably just reboot it. Uh, so the current state of XR in Godot. Um, we implemented the uh, uh, XR. Uh, for Android-based uh, uh, headsets, standalone headsets uh, uh, for Godot 4, and uh, it works pretty well. Uh, there is actually a, 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 an external uh, um, repository uh, that contains an external add-on that you need to add to the Godot project, because uh, every single Android headset vendor uses its own Godot, uh, sorry, OpenXR loader because they couldn't use the standard one, everyone implemented their own, and, uh, the basic, and these are closed source components and we cannot put them, put them into the core Godot projects, that's why we have an add-on that uh, mainly just stores these, these uh, uh, loader libraries and, and uh, this is how we can initialize uh, the, the XR functionality of, of, of each, ha each headset. Uh, then the next part of the question was, what about pass-through and, and AR? And uh, there are uh, 
Actually, there are multiple different vendors who implement uh, these, uh, these uh, functionalities a bit differently. Uh, the OpenXR standard allows for extensions and every vendor started to uh, create their own extensions. Uh, we, we implemented uh, the pastor extension for, for the uh, of Meta, so that, that's, that's actually in, in the core. And we, we also implemented for for uh, four or two, uh, the 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 scene reconstruction uh, extension of Meta, uh, which which uh, allows you to to have uh, meshes uh, of of the surrounding environment in in your scene, so you can do interesting stuff like occlusion and and uh, and to to put uh, so to interact with the environment from your game so this is uh, going to be, be available with 4.2 uh, so actually i think that uh, the support is pretty good there are rough edges and and uh, probably when you start doing a uh, an xr game you will find some issues but but uh, the team who is doing xr is very responsive you can you can reach us uh, uh, in Discord and and also on the on the rocket chat and 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 we will help you out and 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 get your game ready. So so. That's it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, is there a second person that wants to present now and is ready? Oh, I think there. No, anyone that has a sticky note um, and is ready to present? I see someone there. Can come up can come up now. Um, regarding your um, the question was the question was, what are the advantages or disadvantages when using .blend or .gltf files? Well, the answer to that is actually pretty simple. Godot can use .blend file natively, so if you use .blend files, Godot just calls Blender and export it to gltf. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> I would like to ask, though, did that answer the question of the one that was answering? You can gladly add. Okay, the, it, it, it's, almost the, it's almost the same, but you can um, use a, work, a workflow in which it's documented in the, in the documentation of, of, uh, of Godot. If you look at the importing from Blender and you scroll down, you will see that they, they have some if you put some uh, suffix to the name of the object, you can define how this importing will happen. Oh, how this importing will happen. Uh, so I, I am talking by memory, but you can put like um, dash no imp, and then this object will not be imported. You can put dash call, and then this, this object will generate a collision convex hull, or, and you have some some more levels. <laughs> so you can you can use some some more levels like like another one to to select that this object will be invisible but you will use this for collisions and and then you can like define from a lot of objects that you may have in the Blender uh, file, you can select which ones will be call and will be imported and which which one not. So this is uh, a, a bit of difference. Uh, really, once you make the import of the Blender or the Blend file inside Godot, it will launch a, an internal Blender and will do the same thing. So it will be the same. Thank you very much.
Okay, we have one more person that also wants to add to this. Really? <laughs> I'll cut time if it goes too long. Check. Okay. Um, really quick addition to that. Um, in addition to the workflow where you can use dash call or dash no imp or those sorts of things, Godot 4.1, I believe, and 4.2 improves it a little bit, has support for an extension called OMI Physics or OMI Collider, which will allow you to export which will allow you to export objects directly from Blender into either GLTF and I think it's native thing as well if you have the Blender extension installed, um, which supports uh, collision shapes into Godot. So it's a GLTF extension that Godot now supports. I think the Blender is not, the Blender add-on's not finished yet, so it might be difficult to get out of Blender. But if you manage to get an OMI Collider document, that it will work in Godot. Uh, it's called, o it's OMI Groups GitHub. You can find an extension in the GLTF repository there. And Godot supports those. Jim, thank you very much. All right, is your bomb cooled down? <laughs> okay, let's try it then. To the tech people, is it working? It is working, hell yeah. Someone doesn't want this talk to happen. <laughs> uh, it looks like it's switched to another input, right? Now both is black. <laughs> Do you get any signal? I don't have to look. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Gerge Kisha, I'm the CTO of Mijeron, and uh, we have been doing a lot of work with Godot, but uh, no games at all. We, we have been uh, only doing other projects, and uh, let me show you some of the things what we did. So the first one is actually an augmented reality HUD for uh, cars and there is no CGI. It's it's actually recorded on, from a real car, and and what you see uh, being rendered is is uh, is uh, uh, rendered with Godot. There is some Qt in the pipeline because actually the original renderer was an OpenGL Qt hybrid, but uh, we transitioned it to Godot because. Uh, the, with the original renderer, when the designers had an idea uh, that they want. The, the, the designers had an idea uh, to implement something. It took like one week to to have something visual, and of course with Godot, it, it's it's very easy to do, and and uh, and and that's that's why we we made the switch. And the next thing uh, is actually a Quest to add-on. And uh, it's a stereo camera that you can glue in, in the uh, front of the and uh, plug it in with a USB cable and it will provide you with a full color AR experience. Uh, this is a comparison with the, with the Quest Pro and of course this uh, Foxus device is, is much cheaper than buying a Quest Pro. Of course uh, now you can buy the Quest 3 which which, uh, which has stereo vision already but this was done um, a couple of years back so so back back when uh, uh, the not even the Quest Pro was, was available. And 
The next one is a, a robot simulator that we have been working on. Uh, it uh, it allows you. It, is there anyone working in robotics around here? Okay, cool. So we we, we hope to release it soon. Uh, it's uh, it's ROS2 based. Uh, it's also distributed, so you can you can have a, a simulator and you can attach multiple robots to it. Uh, each robot can run it on its own container, and and it's. Uh, you can also attach uh, external clients with uh, with uh, uh, and even VR uh, views to it. So so it, it's a it's a very nice solution. And we are done. Okay, the last one was. Yes, the, la the last one uh, is about embedding uh, Godot into other applications, and this is important because because uh, uh, there are some use cases where where it, you would like to have uh, a, a 3D view or or some special graphics, but you already have your application, and uh, and. Uh, uh, the libgodo patch that we implemented and also the bindings around it and, and the changes to, to core godot allow this to happen so you can basically supply uh, an external surface an external window to godot and tell it okay we want you to render into this place and and uh, we will display it to our user and this this works very nicely uh, and it allows us to do things like let's integrate godot inside Blender, so when an artist works in Blender, they can see their model without any export, without, without any additional steps live previewed in, in, in the Godot renderer. So, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you need any Godot projects developed, we are available. Thank you. Just press the run. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then we're moving on. Um, I see one person already going up to the stage. Please welcome. <coughs> Seems to be some general technical error. We sadly don't know either. Our tech guy doesn't know. All right, then let's do that. Um, is there anyone that wants to present that doesn't require slides? So, okay, I see one person there. I think you were the first. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right, so um, tips for rapid prototyping in Godot. Um, I've done some 20, 30 game jams, so um, that might be, uh, yeah, the same techniques basically go for, for longer prototypes as well, I think. Um, and I'm sure all of you have some experience doing game jams or shorter projects, and um, maybe we can share tips all together. Anyway, I've, I've written some down. Um, first off, use GD scripts. GDScript is awesome for prototyping. Uh, it's really quick to develop with. Um, don't bother with static typing, C sharp, or you don't need it for a quick prototype. You really don't, really don't. Um, <coughs> um, related to that is probably um, hot reload. Uh, I know that if you change your GDScript and save it, it will actually update in your running game. So you can adapt, like if you have a jump speed, normally you might make that an export variable. For a prototype, you just hard code it right there in your GD script file. You save it, hot reload, and then you can try it out in your running game right away. <coughs> um, about artwork, um, 
don't bother with gray boxing if you know that your prototype is going to have some kind of m slightly more final artwork. Just go straight for the final thing, because every time you import some artwork, there will be problems, and you have to fix them. So just go straight for the like final prototype thing, <clears throat> even if it's not great. But um, F6 allows you to run the currently open scene. Um, you probably knew that. So it helps to design your prototype around that so that you can, if you have a level, you can actually have that level in a standalone scene and that it will actually run as a standalone scene. It has everything it needs. Rather than, say, having a main scene that then looks what should the current level be and loads it, because then you can't just quickly try that one level anymore with F6. <coughs> Or maybe if you have to have that set up, then I would recommend saving, just a really quick saving system. Um, could just be two lines of code, save the current level number or even the, the file name of the scene out to a, to a data file, so that if you run your game next time using F5, it will load that in and it will uh, will start from where you left off. Just saves a bunch of time. Um, debug menus can be useful to build. I find Usually it's more hassle than it's worth putting a debug UI into a prototype. What I usually do is just put some hotkeys that are not used in the, in the game, like not WASD, but some other keys, um, like N for go to immediately go to next level. Um, that can be really helpful for, for rapid prototyping too. Um, yeah, I think that's... Oh yeah, and tile maps. Tile maps are really powerful. If you have any kind of grid-based game, um, you can abuse tile maps as sort of your level editor as well, and have um, a special tile layer um, in in Godot 4. You can have tile layers in Godot 3. I would have a separate tile map for that, and have special tiles that the player will never see. But then, when your game starts, it runs through a tile map, and wherever it encounters this kind of special tile, it will spawn an object. Like you can put your player, you can indicate your player start position or, or special behavior for tiles. And in the editor, you can then visually see where these things are. But then at runtime, you just hide that uh, entire layer and do nothing else with it or just delete it outright. Does anyone else, else have any um, rapid prototyping tips? Okay, I will quickly walk around, but we don't have that much time. Oh, Keep that okay. in mind. Uh, if, some, if somebody do want to maybe block out a 3D game, I can recommend Trench Broom for that. Thank you. And the oh. other one was here somewhere. So uh, we used to, to use a plugin, an add-on, that was called Godot Console. And it just opened this kind of console like in all Doom games. So you can actually create your own console uh, commands. And you can, for example, it's quite similar to using the export variables, but you can actually uh, trigger some stuff or create enemies or create some kind of uh, things that pop up in directly in the game. Yeah, yeah. There is an, a, a, a pre-made add-on for that, right? In the in the asset store, I think I've seen it. Yeah. Okay. One re quick repeat of the plugin for the prototype for the block outing was Trench Bloom. So everyone also gets to hear it on the mic. Other than that, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I'm seeing they're still <laughs> working. Um, let's do the hot reload talk next. I saw you were already, yes. Here. It's already unmuted. Woo, epic, hi. You fucking, you fucking lied to me. Like, you announced this talk with like a grand title. This, this note only says hot reload, like, Thanks, great. Anyways, hi, I'm Fio. Um, I'm currently part of the development team of Domekeeper. You may have seen like, like some footage around on uh, the screens here. And for those un unfamiliar, Hot Reload is a feature in Godot where you even where when you run the game with like you know with F5 and F6 and whatever other cool tools you have, 
then even while the game is running in debug mode, you can edit your script and change its behavior. And when you press save, that new behavior gets applied. And so you can, and so you don't have to restart the game every time you want to test some new fucking approach to math that you just came up with. And at, and my most recent use case for Hot Reload was um, implementing like inherited behavior, basically. Um, in Domekeeper, we have several keepers, several basically player characters, and all of them have the same, and all of them inherit from the same basic script that um, dictates that they have some form of move input, but what those individual keepers actually do with that move input and how that gets calculated into their physics processes and stuff, that varies from keeper to keeper. And so, one very effective use of hot reload is just getting down the basic implementation of when the keeper receives an input to the right, move to the right with some force vector, but then that fine tuning of getting the physics just right and like feeling unique that you can do pretty easily with hot reload. One other use case or one other factor that isn't relevant here is that some parts of the game and of the code base can be pretty complicated. Like some bigger games like Domekeeper, they can have like three or four different soft pause states depending on in which menu the player is and like what you're currently selecting and which menu you're in and stuff. And getting some Boolean operators to line up every, to line up correctly every time in every single uh, permutation of the game state can be so difficult. And that is also one of the uh, like things to watch out for with hot reloading is that you should use it with fairly atomized like pieces of your project. Um, like comparing several different Boolean operators or like doing some simple math, that is usually fine. But especially with bigger scenes, especially because you can also reorder the, the scene tree and the remote debugger. Um, you can sometimes run into node reference issues and when you then hot reload, especially if it's like a node you reference in your process function, then you can run into issues where you hot reload the script, the reference is still like from the previous frame that is now incorrect through some like node reference tree garbage and then the game just crashes and you ha and then you have to restart um, because usually the game like or the engine can figure out where the actual new reference is supposed to be. So yeah, reordering the nodes and just generally referencing nodes or changing how you reference the nodes can be an issue in hot reload that depends on your use case but generally it is very useful for like um, just not implementing features that are like more prone to just needing to be fine-tuned with a lot of numerical values or very simple like logical operations and not really like something where you implement an entire new game mechanic and you, all do, and you do all of that uh, during debug runtime. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you for not killing me, for standing up here. You are so cool for that. Here's your mic back. Thank you. Um, I see they fixed it. <laughs> so uh, this is the immersion uh, solution. Uh, a quick overview screenplay is an uh, open source app like Wallpaper Engine. Uh, it's on Steam since 2020. Uh, normally it would display like, can you play the video? Uh, normally, it just plays video or HTML websites. You can see a demo here. Uh, it renders beneath your desktop icons, but above the regular icons. And since last week, I actually managed to get Godot, the latest uh, Godot 4.2 beta running. Uh, sadly, I cannot show you th uh, this one on screen, but you can see it here on my laptop. Uh, it renders a, 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 a Godot scene. Uh, just a test scene, um, and you just uh, sh uh, can set the directory of your project, uh, you can import it, and then it will just display your Godot project. So the idea here is that, for example, you could uh, reuse, for example, your uh, main menu screen as a wallpaper and share it with your community, like uh, a bit of advertisement, but uh, Screenplay in general works on... Uh, on pretty much every OS. So uh, it currently runs on Windows and Mac OS, 
uh, and the Linux version with X11 and Wayland supports coming by the end of this month. Uh, sadly, I cannot show you uh, what I can see on my screen, but you just have to take my work for it, that it runs really great. And yeah, so it's uh, open source, uh, the source code is in GitLab, and it ha also runs via Steam and has Steam Workshop support. So you can upload your Godot wallpaper on Steam and for other people to just one click and download it. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, the one in the orange we shirt. Don't really have an. Okay, then uh, thank you very much. For each. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> If you have any questions still, I'm sure we can find you afterwards or sitting here yeah. somewhere. Uh, I saw you also in the demo area. Yeah. Okay, then perfectly. <laughs> then, um, is there someone else that wants to present? I see someone eagerly taking the stage. Please take the stage about Godot and Rust. So, hello everyone. My name is Jan. I'm the maintainer of the Godot Rust bindings. And I wanted to just have a very quick intro. I didn't actually prepare much, so... Um, yeah, so why Rust? Um, not sure how many of you know Rust or have actually worked with Rust. Oh. Surprising, a big amount, yeah. So, um, as you all know, like, uh, GDScript is really nice for prototyping and you get stuff done really quickly, but it has some issues when you get at a certain scale. So, okay. so um, when you get to a certain scale of your game, you may need certain abstractions like I don't know, generics, trade systems, and so on that GDScript may not have or it may be hard to refactor at a certain scale. Also, you may have certain components in your game that you want to be very high performant, for example, some pathfinding or um, other kind of algorithms that are very customized, or like some third-party integrations, or you may also want to integrate the ecosystem of Rust. So you know other libraries in Rust, crates, that you want to reuse, and that's what Rust could do. So um, it's actually now Tomorrow, it's one year since I've open sourced the Rust bindings for the Godot 4 um, version. So before we had already the GD native bindings, now it's GD extension. And um, I'm actually really eager to look forward to 4.2 because this adds hot reloading into stable Godot, which means the whole workflow becomes much simpler. So far it was every time you needed to reopen the whole editor or your game um, when you had a change, and now it's actually quite nice. So if you want, I can quickly demonstrate the small example. Um, you have two minutes. <laughs> that should be enough. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so here is a small um, example, Dodge the Creeps. It's also the same thing that Godot itself has uh, in GDScript. So I ported this GDScript code to Rust. It's pretty much the exact same thing. So you just get a quick impression of how the the code looks, so you have all these um, procedural macros. So here, derive Godot class means this is basically a class you export to Godot. Then you can have different fields, GD is an object. You see here you have like typing, so option stuff that may be null or may not be null, integers and so on. This is the base, is different than in Godot because you don't have inheritance in Rust, so you actually declare it as a field. So if I compile this now, from the IDE, then the actual game runs, so that's the creeps, you can start, and you know the game can move around and then can intentionally be hit by enemy, just to test, you can restart, and so on. And you saw also compilation is kind of reasonably fast, even though it's Rust, so if I change something here, like, I don't know, start with a score of 100 instead of zero, then, yeah, it's not blazing fast, but it's like two or three seconds. So when I start, you see 100 is applied here. 
So yeah, that was a uh, quick intro about Rush. So if you have more questions or so, feel free to catch me up later. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, is anyone else here with a sticky note that is ready to present? In the back there? Sorry, did I skip for someone on the left? We'll do you next. Just check. How do I unmute it? Okay, I don't have to. Hi, um, I'm Tom. Uh, I don't have a fancy presentation. The only thing I've got is the topic Endless Worlds, which I think is relevant to everyone because the first game everyone wants to make is like a planetary or a solar system scale um, MMORPG, right? Obviously. So um, the way I went about this was I wanted to do, wanted to do a flight simulator basically also planet scale, and it sucks. Like, endless worlds in game engines um, is really difficult. Uh, the main reason for that is mostly maths. Uh, reason being, the positions of things are stored in floats, which you probably know is usually 32 bits, and that's the limit. So. If you want to represent any number, you only have that size to work with. So if the numbers get really big, say a million, then you have little space behind the, the dots or the comma to represent any detail. So if you're very far from the origin, uh, objects basically jump about. So you can't move on like centimeter scales. The further you're away from origins, the uh, further objects jump from step to step and physics break apart and such. So what do you do about that? Well, um, the easiest fix, for, easiest fix for it is uh, you basically chunk your world. So the second you get far enough away from your, from your origin, usually about two kilometers, uh, then you have to move every single object there is uh, around the camera closer to the origin. So you move everything, which performance-wise kind of sucks. Now, what could do for? I think has introduced is uh, double precision positions, so 40, 64 bit, uh, which alleviates the problem to a certain extent, but you still can't do like something like solar scale, solar system scale things. So you still move your origins about, which takes a lot of performance. There is lots of work around you do. Some games, um, they render multiple viewports. I don't know if you've been to the talk about viewports, but you render the close things in one image and then superimpose that on top of another image. Uh, that helps with the distances. So you have one very coarse resolution for big things like planets and then another viewport for very small things such as a cockpit or switches, uh, stuff like that. And another solution we have found to be working if you don't have an awful lot of objects in your scene is just keeping the player at the center origin and then moving everything else around. Kind of works, but you have to move everything at the same time, which gets performance intensive as well. So there isn't an easy solution. Um, if you want to do endless worlds, don't. <laughs> and if somebody forces you to um, try uh, the floating origin version where you move things about sequentially. Cheers. Um, thank you very much. We have time for about two more talks. Um, one person really wanted to present, and I don't. We'll have to see who the other person is. Um, maybe they're also fast enough. There are still a lot of people. I don't know. We sadly don't have the time. Um, we'll just go through. Hello. So I'm going to present about uh, importing Unity assets in XR. So. Um, I work on this project called Unit.Importer. So it's a um, it's a project that will allow you to convert. It's actually less of an importer, more of a converter. So you can take your Unity package assets and port them into Godot. It's part of the vSakai project. Um, so if I go here, um, drag this over, um, this 
Sure, that works. This is a um, Unity package scene that from the Unity Asset Store that is imported in Godot. It contains a bunch of different objects in it. Um, and uh, uh, basically, you can go and import a .unity package file. I'll pick this one. Uh, and Oh, this is makes it slower. Um, you can basically select which assets you want to import. These are actually native Unity formats. Uh, and then if I go and import these things, it'll import them. Uh, part of this project, that does not do scripts. It's just the assets. So if you've scenes, if you have like avatars, if you have uh, characters and animations and humanoid animations, it will import all of those into the Godot humanoid system. Um, and you can then use those as characters in a, uh, in a virtual environment. Um, let's see what I have time for. Okay, the import finished. So let's go take a look at the scene. Uh, this is actually an interactive scene made in Unity. Uh, well, we'll see if it works. Uh, anyway, uh, get those. Oh, it's. Oh, it worked. Okay. Um, so one of the things I want to show here is this actually imports animation trees. So these uh, is an, an animator controller in Unity. It was converted to a native Godot animation tree with all animations intact. Comes with a little like inspector script that you can use to trigger the animations. So in this case, it like makes a little like booth appear with some Godot paraphernalia. And so this scene was made in Unity. None of this stuff was manually tweaked for Godot. This was directly imported to Godot with the animations intact. Um, so yeah, this, that's kind of an example of some of the stuff this can do. It can also play uh, humanoid animations. This is a Unity floss.anim file being played on a character imported from a Unity package, but it can be played on any Godot avatar imported with a skeleton profile humanoid. You can check my talk yesterday in the lightning talks. And finally, uh, since the question relates to XR, I'm going to pull over a, another project I have open. Um, this is my five-minute XR demo I gave at FOSS XR 2022, uh, uh, where I showed how to make like a really simple XR project in Godot. Um, as an example, uh, it's very easy to create XR. You don't have to import package manager. You don't have to create new assets. You literally go and you make your character body like normal. You can put an XR origin inside with an XR camera. You put your left hand, your right hand as XR, control, XR node 3D objects. And you go put it into a world. And here you go, you've got your project. If I had an XR headset plugged in, it would play on it right now. Um, I don't know why it's playing on Chrome. Um, let's try that again. Uh, anyway, that's, that's my demo. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we have about time for one more quick talk. Um, is there anyone that still wants to present real quick? Please go ahead. It is already unmuted. Yeah, so it's unmuted. OK, perfect. So mine is closer and pointed towards your mouth. Yeah, mine is 2D level design tips how to start. Very easy. Use the tile map. It's, you know, super straightforward. All you got to do is don't use any art, just use abstraction. So it's like if something is going to uh, bounce you up, just use like a blue square. And if it's, and if it's a, a platform, just use white squares. Um, you can add physics to it. So like if you touch on the blue square, the velocity will take you up. You can also, um, in the tile map, you could import scenes into it, not just... So it's like if, uh, let's say something is going to hurt you, you could have like a, an area 2D scene and it could be like 16 by 16. So then you can just put that straight into the tile map and paint it in. So yeah, that's very simple way of level design tips in, yeah. And I, would, I know it's time to go. So let's just, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I hope we could, could, have an, I could answer most of your questions. Um, this will end the lightning talk. We'll we have basically no time left. Um...